don't know about you folks, but I'm ashamed about some things. I'm ashamed of some things. Can I whisper this to you? I find it hard to whisper anyhow. But I'm ashamed of what the Supreme Court did. I'm ashamed about that. But I want you to know one thing. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I want you to take your Bibles, please, and come with me to the book of Romans. I'm so glad to see you, dear folks, today. I just, hey, I've got that lady back here. I figure she wasn't. Now, the people who are watching at home don't know what we're talking about. But we've got a lady in this audience who is mightily anointed. In fact, she is so good, I think I'll give, if it wasn't the Sabbath, I'd give her a job offer. Just to come with me on my campaigns and to say all those hallelujahs. Because you know what it does? It makes you... <laughs> She's ready to go. Okay. Goodness me. I just hope my heart is good enough to take the stimulation she's starting to give now. Romans. <laughs> Folks, <it's> all... <laughs> Folks, I want to tell you all something. You know what? Can I tell you all something? <laughs> just wondering what you had for dinner, much? Uh, lunch. <laughs> But can I tell you something? It's all right to laugh in church. We're all happy. Didn't you hear what Danny said? We're all happy. <laughs> okay, look at this text. And I don't call him Donnie at all. You know, you're talking this morning saying, I call him Donnie. I call him Danny. So you know what the problem is? It's not my accent at all. It's his ears. <laughs> Doesn't hear it properly. All right, let's get to the text, folks, or else we're never going to get out of here. Romans 1 and verse 16. Now, I'm ashamed of many things, but here it is, though. Romans 1, 16, 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Folks, I just say amen to that. Because of what my eyes have seen, I want you to know Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a conviction, and I mentioned this, I think it was on Thursday night when I spoke about the hour of his power. I believe I've got a burning conviction in my soul that the hour is ripe for the preaching of the gospel to the world. I want you to turn over here to one of our great texts, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 and 7. Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. This chapter talks about the times and it talks about the power. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 and 7, Then I saw another angel flying in mid-air, and uh, he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and uh, people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The Bible says in this text, it says, the hour of his judgment is come. It's come. It is here now. This is really a prophecy. 
But the Bible tells us that the time would come in the history of the human race when a message would go out around the world. The hour of his judgment is come. It is now. Let me simply go through a little of some of the great signs. I mentioned these on Thursday night. Let me say it again. Number one. The coming financial earthquake. We know that this great country that was raised up by God to be a bastion of freedom for the world, we know this great country through gross irresponsibility. Hear what I said? Gross irresponsibility has a debt now approaching 19,000 billion dollars, 19 trillion. Other economists say, no, it is not true. If the people were told the truth by their leaders, they would know that the debt of the United States is more like 180 trillion dollars. Can you not understand now why commentators are coming on television and they're doing ads and they're, they're saying, buy silver, buy gold, buy property, because they say we are coming to the end of civilization as we understand it. Sign number two, the destruction of the earth. The Bible says Jesus will come at that period in earth's history and will destroy those who are destroying the earth. Even now, as I speak, planet earth is so sick that planet earth is running a fever. It is a sign that we've come to the hour of God's judgment. Number three, the rise of these ungodly, evil terrorists, such as ISIS. Did you know in Scripture, I'm going to show it to you, and this could take, you know, a complete exposition, but let me show it to you very fast. Come over here to Revelation chapter, chapter 8, shall we say. Revelation chapter, chapter 9. Revelation chapter nine and you can read these conclusions in that great book called Revelation that comes out of Andrews University. Uh, it's an outstanding book. Revelation chapter nine, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given, who is this? This is Lucifer. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace, the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. You know who these scorpions are. This is a picture of the last days. And here is this mighty fallen angel, and he's got permission to bring forth the demons of the bottomless pit. The demons of hell. When I turn on television and I see these people in the name of their God uh, murdering Christians, chopping off their heads, murdering their fellow Muslims, it is a time, it is a time mentioned in the scriptures that the hour of his judgment has come. And then I could talk at length, and I'm going to do so a little bit today, about the gospel explosion. I am not a pessimist because of what my eyes have seen. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in the whole wide world. Nothing can stop it, my friend. You can't stop the tide from coming in. You can have evil people and even so-called good people who try to stop this gospel explosion. And you can have all the politics in the world and in the church that try to stop the tide of God's grace coming in, but you can't stop it. I've seen 
the flooding tide of God's power. I've seen it in China. I've seen it there with the pastors, young women, one young woman pastoring a church of 20,000. That's more than any one of our churches here in the United States. I've seen young men in Russia. I've seen them in Africa. I've seen the Spirit of God coming down upon the people of God. I have seen the latter rain. And therefore, I say to you, we are living in the time of the judgment hour. The hour of his judgment is come, and a message goes forth to the world. Would you come back now, please, to the book of Romans? As you know, I'm just an old-fashioned Bible preacher, and I use the Bible lots because the power is not in the preacher. The power is in the Word. Romans chapter 1 and verse 14 and onwards, my dear friends. Paul said, I'm obligated. King James Version says, what does it say in the KJV? I'm a debtor. Sounds even better in the KJV. King James Version. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's the first phrase. I am a debtor. Because Christ has died for me, I have an obligation. I'm a debtor to every person. I can't stay home. I can't retire. I can't go and sit on the beach in Australia because I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor to the Russians. I'm a debtor to Julia. I'm a debtor. And so are you, my friend. We have an eternal debt. I'm a debtor. That is why, verse 15, that is why I am so eager. I am a debtor. And I am ready, I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. And the third point is, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for in the gospel of righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Will you think for a moment of the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is not about you. It's about Christ. It's the good news of Christ. Ellen White made a great statement. She said, hanging on the cross was the gospel. Hanging on the cross. Jesus said this. You can read about it in the Gospels. You know the text. For God so loved the world. But he also said in that same uh, passage that contains the world's most famous text, For God so loved the world, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, what a strange figure of speech. Why would God say this as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness? Why didn't he say, as Moses lifted up the lamb? We can sort of relate to that, can't we? As Moses lifted up the lamb, but he doesn't say that. He says, as Moses lifted up the snake, the serpent. What does it mean? The snake, the symbol of sin, the symbol of the curse of God, the symbol of lostness. When Christ was lifted up between heaven and earth, he became in the sight of God the greatest sinner who had ever lived, even though he was the most sinless. And the sin of the world my sin. What is God like? What is this God like? What is the Creator like? He said, Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What is He like? Hanging on the cross was God. You say, God doesn't understand my pain. 
Yes, he does. God doesn't know what it is to suffer. He's sitting up there on his throne. What does God know about it? As I said to the Russians, you think God doesn't care. God cares because on the cross he tasted all the pain, all the sorrow. He tasted the anguish of the atheist when he's dying. He tasted the, the lostness of the soul who has turned away from God. He tasted the pain of cancer and heart disease. He tasted what it was to be rejected by a bigoted racist. He tasted all of this. And because he was bearing it, he tasted the vengeance of a holy God as the serpent. Can you see that? He tasted it. He tasted it. On the cross, he was like the serpent. That's what it says, Jesus said. As the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, he became sin for us, even though he knew no sin. That is why I was able to turn to vast audiences in Russia, where I had the privilege over the period of time I was there to preach to more than three million Russians. And I could say to them, atheists, communists and Marxists and members of the KGB I I say this humbly please understand I say this to the glory of God I was twice invited by the KGB to preach to them the KGB chief came to me General Vladimir and he put his hand on his heart and he said Pastor Carter don't forget us we too have souls uh -huh. People say you can't reach those people, they're too bad. No, they're sinners, the same as us, and a lot easier to reach on many occasions than the people who go to church because they feel their need. Don't forget us. Don't forget us. And when I preached to the Russians, I said, Marxism said, you are an animal. That's all you are because of the doctrine of evolution. You're simply an animal. Most likely, you're not even an animal. You're only a machine. You're only a thing. As Darwin taught, you're only the product, wait for this, you're only the product of time plus matter plus chance. That's all you are. You're the product of time plus matter plus chance. That's what the communists taught them. I stood before them and because of Calvary, I was able to say to them, you are not an animal. You are not a machine. You are a child of God. Do you want to know how important you are? The God who made the stars, we now know how many galaxies there are. 200 uh, billion galaxies. 200 billion. Each galaxy is composed of about 200 billion blazing suns. And the God who made this, the God who flung the stars in space, can we ever, ever, ever get this into our tiny little minds that the God who made this almost infinite universe was nailed to a cross? So I said to them, what is God like? You feel that you're not loved? He would have done this for one person. I made an appeal to the KGB, thousand officers standing there. Quite amazing. You've seen in the movies those big black cars that they drive? They sent some cars around to pick up my team and pick up me. I say this to the glory of God. Let it be to the glory of God. We've got nothing to boast about. Without the grace of God, you know what we are? 
We are animated mud on the way to dust. You hear this? We're animated mud on the way to dust, except for Calvary. And I spoke about these things to the KGB. And I made an appeal. I made an appeal for Christ. And the first person on his feet was the KGB general. Got up, clicked his heels. And the colonels got up and stood beside him. Stood up there. Then I appealed to the KGB officers. As I was preaching, I say this to the glory of God, because you, you see, I have seen the glory of God. I've seen the power of God. I'm not a college professor. God bless them. I am not an armchair theologian. I am not a church administrator. God bless them too. <laughs> but I've seen the glory of God. And as I was preaching on what God is like, here he is, God. He's hanging on the cross. You know what they did? You know what they did? They wept. They wept. Ever wept in church? They wept. When I had the altar call, the flood of humanity was so great from the KGB that they thought I'd be killed, crushed. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And let us never take glory to ourselves. We are nothing without God. How, what audacity for any one of us to become puffed up with our little bit of pride. Look at me. Mm -hmm. Without the grace of God, we are animated mud on the way to dust. But by the grace of God, because of Calvary, you are not an animal. You are not a machine. You are a child of God. And God loves you. Let me tell you about something that happened after we went to Russia. I was invited to go to Ukraine, to the great city of Kiev. This is an amazing story. People say, you, you know, you, you making up these stories. No, there are lots of stuff. I can't tell you because it is too sensitive. So I'm leaving out a lot. Our quarter has, is only ever being told. But when we were planning to go to Kiev, this big city, the capital of Ukraine, the Archbishop of the great Orthodox Church said this, because we put out our advertising. Now, I say this humbly. I guess I better talk softly. He said, John Carter will come and preach in this city over my dead body. I wouldn't want to say a thing like that. Hmm. We'd hide a, a great theater that would seat with people standing at least 12,000. And he said, he said it publicly, he said it in the cathedral, he said it on television, John Carter will preach here only over my dead body. A few days before we arrived in the city and got off the plane, He was struck down, a young man in the prime of life. His followers said, we're going to bury him in the National Cathedral. The Ukrainian government said, no, not after what he said. They said, bury him on the sidewalk. The priests took up the crosses. And they went out and they battled with the militia in the streets of Kiev and turned the streets red with blood. That's when we arrived. I go there, you know, once 
a year sometimes, sometimes every two years, and I go to the cathedral. And outside the cathedral is a coffin on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. He is the man who said, no, he's not going to preach in this city, and if he does, it'll be over my dead body. Now, let me tell you folks something. I'm going to say this to you because I've told lots of people this. I won't tell you whom I've told this. Never try to stop the work of God. Mm. Don't say, this is not going to happen because it's going to interfere with our little program. Let God be God. We opened there on a Saturday, Saturday afternoon. Saturday morning, I thought I'll just go down to the auditorium. I've got a great team from America and Australia. Got one of the great best men for sound you'll find anywhere in the world, Bob Ludwig, who has done the sound for four U.S. presidents. It does the sound for the Carter Report. And so I went down to the auditorium at about 9 in the morning. 6,000 people there outside. I thought, well, it's looking good. We open in six hours' time. When I went down at 3 o'clock, inside the building, you would have had 12 to 15,000 people standing shoulder to shoulder. You couldn't move. No noise but people standing shoulder to shoulder, and outside, 100,000 people who couldn't get in. 100,000. Every day, the government sent out a decree, and they said, we're going to close you down. I was called to the city hall in Kiev, and the minister of religion said to me, we issue, issue you, John Carter, with an edict you are to close down the meetings today. So I said, uh, no. He said, no, we're not joking with you. We'll put you in prison. Now, I say this to the glory of God. I said, go ahead. Uh-huh. Did you see what happened to the bishop? Uh-huh. I said, did you see what happened to the bishop? Go ahead. They said, we will put you in prison. I said, go ahead. But then they had a committee meeting. I was the first minister they'd ever met who'd said no to them. This is true. Most ministers cower. Got all these government officials. I said, no. Every night, we had these vast crowds of people. Then the government said, we're going to close you down. You can't have any police come. And if there are no police there to protect the people, you're illegal, so we're going to close you down. And so the police stopped coming. But a major in the police force heard about it. He heard what was going on, and he got on the phone, and he called to the police from another city. Every night, every day, there was a battle. And then in the end... I said, we're going to have a baptism. They said, well, you can only baptize 100 people. I said, remember the bishop. <laughs> they said, 100 people. They said, you can't get buses. So they told all of the bus companies in Kiev, you cannot rent buses to these, these Adventist Christians. But people heard about it. And bus companies from all over Ukraine sent their buses. And we had a baptism in the Dnieper River, the largest baptism in a thousand years. Glory be to God. 3,500 souls baptized in the waters of the Dnieper River. Can't you see I'm full of courage? Can't you see why I believe? Can't you see why I believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? Now, yes, hallelujah, sister, praise God. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there's a person, I have a wonderful team of people. I've got volunteers and people whom are, are on, who are on the staff. And a number of years ago, this lady joined our team. She is the communications director for the Carter Report. And those of you who get our newsletters, and everybody ought to get our newsletters, will often see there that it's signed by Susan because she's the person who, with my wife and my son and others, help us to preach the gospel. Now, Susan, would you like to come out? Would you please welcome Susan P. Rhino? Howdy. Well, good afternoon. It's been an honor and a privilege to be here with you all and to uh, just be part of this wonderful uh, camp meeting that's taking place. And uh, I just want to share a few things. I've been working with Pastor Carter in the ministry for 22 years now. And it's been the biggest blessing of my life. And, and, uh, and the longest 22 years, <laughs> she tells me. <laughs> no, and I've had the privilege of experiencing so many wonderful things and seeing how God has worked every single year when we've gone out on different campaigns all over the world. But a little selfishly, I will say, the best experience that I've had is when I came to know the Lord, and that was through this ministry as well. Pastor Carter had a, uh, a campaign which he held in Los Angeles back in 1990, and I had grown up in the church, and uh, unfortunately around the age of 17 or 18, I decided that I didn't need to be in the church anymore. And I stopped attending church for many, many years, and I met my husband, I got married, and I had a couple of children, and when the children came into the picture, I knew that I needed to bring my children into church as well. Because I had a mother who was always praying for me. And you know, in Proverbs it says, train up your child in the way they should go, because when they grow up, they will not depart. So mothers and fathers, keep praying for your kids. Because even though I had left the church, my mother was always praying and always inviting me to come back to church. But now with two little children that were my responsibility, I knew that I needed to have them know the Lord. So my mother invited me to the Shrine Auditorium where this gentleman from Australia was holding some meetings. And uh, my husband and I decided we would come because it wasn't held in a church. Had the meetings been in a church, we wouldn't have gone. But it was in a public place. And so I thought, okay, this will be great. So we ended up coming to the Shrine Auditorium and I heard I heard the gospel for the very first time in my life. And it, uh, it drew at my heart and my husband's as well. And I remember thinking, I know that one of these e evenings, Pastor Carter's gonna make an appeal because I grew up in church and I know how it works. And so uh, when he finally made that appeal, I had the biggest struggle of my life because I thought the Lord is giving me my opportunity now with my husband here beside me and my heart was racing 100 miles an hour when I heard him say, stand up if you would like to give your life to Jesus. And I, it was a struggle, let me tell you, because I knew that once I made that decision to stand up, that I wouldn't be going back. And the Lord gave me the strength to stand up, and my husband that stood up with me, and we decided to give our lives to Jesus Christ, and we were shortly baptized after that, and we've been with Pastor Carter ever since, and that's been over 25 years now. And it has been the best experience of our lives, traveling with him all over the world and seeing so many wonderful people come to know Jesus Christ and to hear that our salvation is only through Jesus Christ. And to preach the gospel in Africa, in India, in Russia, Ukraine, um, and last year in El Salvador, where we finally went to a country where we were able to speak the language as well, because my family is from Chile. And so uh, we were able to communicate with all of those wonderful people attending. We had 55,000 people come to the stadium. And we had a baptism at the end of the meetings. And 4,500 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. So we live and we work for a powerful living God. And he is in control. And I just want to say thank you for being with us. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for standing with us and supporting us. Because we have a great work to do. And time is coming to a quick end. And so God is giving us this last opportunity to keep proclaiming the gospel and to keep 
allowing people to come and know him and to have a place in the kingdom with us all. So God bless you all, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to share our wonderful stories with you and to together as we continue doing this work. God bless, and thank you for the privilege, Pastor Carter, of being part of your team. Susie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless Susie, and God bless Javier and their children. What should I tell you? I've got so much I could tell you. You want to hear the story about the dove? Well, this man obviously does. Uh, we went to P&G, Port Moresby, the most dangerous city in the world. You can easily be killed in Port Moresby. We hired a, the biggest stadium, an outdoor stadium, football place. Just got a little team. My son David was in charge of setting it up, and Pastor Harold Harker from Australia. We had a great team. We built the biggest screens that they've ever seen in these countries, and we used the most powerful video projectors. And Bob comes along with Don Beagle, another one of our sound engineers, and we have sound such as you would have uh, in a great rock concert. So people can hear a mile away. We started with a ra rather small crowd of 70,000. The next night it was 80, then it was 100, then the newspaper said these are the biggest crowds in the history of the South Pacific, 130,000. As we came towards the end, we had 150,000. Let me tell you what happened though. We had to throw it into the hands of God because over here to the left, there was a vast stadium, another one, like a big football field. And so they said, what are we going to do? I said, build another giant screen. We've got another giant video projector. So we built a screen there. I don't know how many people were down there, maybe 30 or 40,000. And then we discovered there was another football stadium just a quarter of a mile down the road, and it was packed also. So possibly we had 200,000 people. You think it's easy? No, I was preaching to people, many of them, who had hard hearts. And when I'd make an appeal, I had to work. I had to work hard, pray hard. Lord, I'm not getting through to these people. Help me, Jesus. And when I'm making an appeal, I, I usually stop and I say it out loud, Lord, I, I can't do any more. I pass the meeting into your hands. Now, Lord, I'm going to step back. And I'll just stop and I'll say, now, Lord, talk to their hearts. But as we came towards the end of the series and the people were resisting, after the meeting one night, my young pastors from PNG, Papua New Guinea, they came to me and they said, Pastor Carter, the church members are astounded. A great white dove flew over the audience. I said, I never saw it. They said, we didn't either, but our church members say, God is visiting his people. I never saw this. But the next night, we had a vast audience have you seen an audience as far as the eye can see? It doesn't end. And I was out the back behind. I have these giant blackboards, and I write on these blackboards, and I have these giant screens. And I was out the back, and I was talking to some of the government ministers. The campaign didn't move the city. It moved the nation. The ministers of the government, the parliamentarians, came to the meeting one night, and I said, what are you doing here? They said, we've come to be blessed. Would you put your hands upon us? So they came up the front, and we, in the name of Jesus, put our hands upon them and called them to be good people, to be honest and above corruption, and to uphold Christ in their work. So I was talking to the minister of justice, he said, the prime minister is coming to see you. He wants your prayers. He knows what is happening here. And the prime minister wants your prayers. 
and he wants you to pray for the cabinet. And this happened later. So I was talking to him out the back. And then I heard my brother, the sound of many waters, like the roar of many waters mentioned in the Bible. I have a great singer whose name is Willie G. Some of you folks will remember little Willie from the Midnighters. Not in your church, obviously. A famous group used to sing around the world. They were not a Christian group that this man now is a born-again Christian, and he was standing out the front, and only as Willie can sing, he was holding the audience in the hollow of his hands. And then, as I came out and looked, Willie was pointing up to the heavens. And the people were standing to their feet. Their hands up. All the people standing to their feet. Pointing to the heavens. What a sight. 150,000 people with their hands up. And there she came, uh, this great white dove that has never been seen before in that part of the world. It doesn't live there. And it came over the audience, and as it came over the audience, I looked up, and the dove flashed over my head. That night when I went out to make an appeal, let me tell you what happened. Mm -hmm. I made an appeal in the name of Jesus. And I said, God has visited us. He's come here. God has visited his people. He's come here tonight. Don't despise these things. We don't go by signs and wonders. We go by the word of God. But sometimes God in his infinite mercy and power sends us signs and wonders. As I made that appeal that night, I guess 50 or 60,000 people came forward in the altar call. Just a flood of humanity People with their hands raised, begging God for prayer. They came from across this side here. They came in a flood from that part of the stadium, outside the stadium. Just the other day, I got a letter from one of the leaders of the gangs. He told me, you are not aware of this, but all of the gang leaders were in your meetings murderers and rapists. Do you think I was scared? No, I wasn't scared. Do you think my life was in danger? My life was not in danger because God was there and God restrained those gang members and those gang members. And you know what we, you know, I like to say it to the President of the United States, there's an answer to violence in America. There's an answer to all of these killings. There's an answer to Ferguson. There's an answer to all of these cities. And I'm going to tell you what it is. It's not more government. It's more Jesus Christ. What America needs, I'm telling you, we don't need more politicians. And we don't need more legislation. And we don't need more lectures. We need preachers filled with the Holy Spirit preaching to our young white men and our young black men. That's what we need. And this gang leader wrote me this letter. He said, Pastor Carter, I was the leader of a gang. We were murderers and rapists. And he said, I am now a member of the church. I was baptized after you left. Thousands have been baptized. And he said, I had my cell phone there that night. And he said, I, I was recording the music. And he said, I'm sending you what the cell phone recorded. He said, it comes on at such and such a time. So he sent it to me. And I looked at it on my iPad from his cell phone. And there she came, this great white dove. Mm. We had a baptism down at the beach. Thousands baptized in, in, the, in the ocean. On that Sabbath morning, it was our privilege to baptize 3,000 people out in the ocean. But as we were having the baptism, people came to us later and they said, did you see? 
did you see? I said, what? I saw the people. I was pretty busy. They said, the white dove came in again from the horizon, and it came in low over the ocean, and it came over the people. Now, you can say to me, you know, uh, that's just a bird. But nobody else in PNG had seen such a bird. It came at the right time. There are people I cannot forget. Dr. Julia Ukana, support her. Support 3ABN, Julia, the Chernobyl pastor, the young pastor who came from Chernobyl with a busload of people from Chernobyl, the most dangerous place in the world. I said, Pastor, you're a young man. If you stay there, the radiation is going to kill you. He said, how can I leave them? How can I leave them? He said, these are my people. How can I forget him? Paul the prisoner. Whenever I go to Moscow, I expect to be there in a couple of months. Paul the prisoner. Betrayed by a church member. In the days of the communists. Betrayed by a church member. They put him in prison because he was a preacher of the gospel and they put him in a refrigerator cell. So they froze him. Then they'd take him out and warm him up, put him back in. His teeth fell out. I said, did you betray your brethren? He said, no, no, never. He's tall, he's gaunt. He's my friend. We call him Paul the prisoner. Can you see why I go back? The man with the gun in Irkuts in Siberia. Beverly was speaking. I want to say hi to Beverly. Hello, Beverly. She's watching this telecast out in Thousand Oaks. She was speaking, but a young man came to get after me with a gun. He worked in the special forces, the Russian special forces. Don't mess with them. He came with a gun, but he came drunk, and he came to do me in. But Beverly was talking. Then as he came up on the stage, I sat behind Beverly. The security people rushed, and I took him down. Then they got his revolver, heaps of bullets. The Russian officials came and said to me, we're going to put him in prison until he rots. He'll never get out. I said, forgive him. What? Forgive him. I said, because Christ forgave him, as he'll forgive you. The KGB people said to me, we've never heard of a God like this. We forgive him. He came back to the meetings as my bodyguard. And as I made an appeal for Christ, the next night, his hand was raised. He came down the front. I hugged him. My friend, what a day it's going to be when we see all these people in glory. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I thank you, Lord. I want to pray for you. Would you close your eyes? Dear Father, take these wonderful, beautiful people here at 3ABN. Thank you for Danny Shelton and his team. Bless 3ABN. Thank you for the miracles. And thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you that Jesus saves. And thank you that soon and very soon we're going to see the King. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.